Dive with us into the fascinating world of biographies, histories, and speeches as we learn from the words of the past. Book 3, Part 2 of Eusebius Church History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson. Church History by Eusebius of Caesarea, translated by Arthur Cushman McGifford. Book 3, Part 2, Chapters 7 through 21. Chapter 7 The Predictions of Christ. It is fitting to add to these accounts the true prediction of our Saviour, in which he foretold these very events. His words are as follows, Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. The historian reckoning the whole number of the slain, says that eleven hundred thousand persons perished by famine and sword, and that the rest of the rioters and robbers, being betrayed by each other after the taking of the city, were slain. But the tallest of the youths and those that were distinguished for beauty were preserved for the triumph. Of the rest of the multitude, those that were over seventeen years of age were sent as prisoners to labor in the works of Egypt, while still more were scattered through the provinces to meet their death in the theatres by the sword and by beasts. Those under seventeen years of age were carried away to be sold as slaves, and of these alone the number reached ninety thousand. These things took place in this manner in the second year of the reign of Vespasian, in accordance with the prophecies of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who by divine power saw them beforehand as if they were already present, and wept and mourned according to the statement of the holy evangelists, who gave the very words which he uttered, when, as if addressing Jerusalem herself, he said, If thou hadst known, even thou, in this day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a rampart about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee and thy children even with the ground. And then, as if speaking concerning the people, he says, For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And again, when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. If any one compares the words of our Saviour with the other accounts of the historian concerning the whole war, how can one fail to wonder, and to admit that the foreknowledge and the prophecy of our Saviour were truly divine and marvelously strange? Concerning those calamities, then, that befell the whole Jewish nation after the Saviour's passion, and after the words which the multitude of the Jews uttered, when they begged the release of the robber and murderer, but besought that the Prince of Life should be taken from their midst, it is not necessary to add anything to the account of the historian. But it may be proper to mention also those events which exhibited the graciousness of that all-good providence, which held back their destruction full forty years after their crime against Christ, during which time many of the apostles and disciples, and James himself the first bishop there, the one who is called the brother of the Lord, were still alive, and dwelling in Jerusalem itself, remained the surest bulwark of the place. Divine providence thus still proved itself long-suffering toward them, in order to see whether by repentance for what they had done, they might obtain pardon and salvation. And in addition to such long-suffering, providence also furnished wonderful signs of the things which were about to happen to them, if they did not repent. Since these matters have been thought worthy of mention by the historian already cited, we cannot do better than to recount them for the benefit of the readers of this work. Chapter 8. The Signs Which Preceded the War Taking then the work of this author, read what he records in the sixth book of his history. His words are as follows. 
Thus were the miserable people won over at this time by the impostors and false prophets. But they did not give heed nor give credit to the visions and signs that foretold the approaching desolation. On the contrary, as if struck by lightning, and as if possessing neither eyes nor understanding, they slighted the proclamations of God. At one time a star, in form like a sword, stood over the city, and a comet, which lasted for the whole year, and again before the revolt and before the disturbances that led to the war, when the people were gathered for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on the eighth of the month Xanthicus, at the ninth hour of the night, so great a light shone about the altar and the temple that it seemed to be bright day, and this continued for half an hour. This seemed to the unskillful a good sign, but was interpreted by the sacred scribes as portending those events which very soon took place. And at the same feast a cow, led by the high priest to be sacrificed, brought forth a lamb in the midst of the temple. And the eastern gate of the inner temple, which was of bronze and very massive, and which at evening was closed with difficulty by twenty men, and rested upon iron-bound beams, and had bars sunk deep in the ground, was seen at the sixth hour of the night to open of itself. And not many days after the feast, on the twenty-first of the month Artemisium, a certain marvelous vision was seen which passes belief. The prodigy might seem fabulous were it not related by those who saw it, and were not the calamities which followed deserving of such signs. For before the setting of the sun chariots and armed troops were seen throughout the whole region in mid-air, wheeling through the clouds and encircling the cities. And at the feast which is called Pentecost, when the priests entered the temple at night, as was their custom to perform the services, they said that at first they perceived a movement and a noise, and afterward a voice as of a great multitude saying, Let us go hence. But what follows is still more terrible. For a certain Jesus, the son of Ananias, a common countryman, four years before the war, when the city was particularly prosperous and peaceful, came to the feast, at which it was customary for all to make tents at the temple to the honor of God, and suddenly began to cry out, A voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and the temple, a voice against bridegrooms and brides, a voice against all the people. Day and night he went through all the alleys crying thus. But certain of the more distinguished citizens, vexed at the ominous cry, seized the man and beat him with many stripes but without uttering a word in his own behalf, or saying anything in particular to those that were present, he continued to cry out in the same words as before. And the rulers, thinking as was true that the man was moved by a higher power, brought him before the Roman governor. And then, though he was scourged to the bone, he neither made supplication nor shed tears, but changing his voice to the most lamentable tone possible, he answered each stroke with the words, Woe, woe unto Jerusalem. The same historian records another fact still more wonderful than this. He says that a certain oracle was found in their sacred writings which declared that at that time a certain person should go forth from their country to rule the world. He himself understood that this was fulfilled in Vespasian. But Vespasian did not rule the whole world, but only that part of it which was subject to the Romans. With better right could it be applied to Christ, to whom it was said by the Father, Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the ends of the earth for thy possession. At that very time, indeed, the voice of his holy apostles went throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Chapter 9 Josephus, and the works which he has left. After all this, it is fitting that we should know something in regard to the origin and family of Josephus, who has contributed so much to the history in hand. He himself gives us information on this point in the following words. Josephus, the son of Mattathias, a priest of Jerusalem, who himself fought against the Romans in the beginning, and was compelled to be present at what happened afterward. He was the most noted of all the Jews of that day, not only among his own people, but also among the Romans, so that he was honored by the erection of a statue in Rome, and his works were deemed worthy of a place in the library. 
He wrote the whole of the Antiquities of the Jews in twenty books, and a history of the war with the Romans which took place in his time in seven books. He himself testifies that the latter work was not only written in Greek, but that it was also translated by himself into his native tongue. He is worthy of credit here because of his truthfulness in other matters. There are extant also two other books of his which are worth reading. They treat of the antiquity of the Jews, and in them he replies to Appion the grammarian, who had at that time written a treatise against the Jews, and also to others who had attempted to vilify the hereditary institutions of the Jewish people. In the first of these books he gives the number of the canonical books of the so-called Old Testament. Apparently drawing his information from ancient tradition, he shows what books were accepted without dispute among the Hebrews. His words are as follows. Chapter 10. The Manner in Which Josephus Mentions the Divine Books We have not, therefore, a multitude of books disagreeing and conflicting with one another, but we have only twenty-two, which contain the record of all time and are justly held to be divine. Of these, five are by Moses, and contain the laws and the tradition respecting the origin of man, and continue the history down to his own death. This period embraces nearly three thousand years. From the death of Moses to the death of Artaxerxes, who succeeded Xerxes as king of Persia, the prophets that followed Moses wrote the history of their own times in thirteen books. The other four books contain hymns to God, and precepts for the regulation of the life of men. From the time of Artaxerxes to our own day, all the events have been recorded, but the accounts are not worthy of the same confidence that we repose in those which preceded them, because there has not been during this time an exact succession of prophets. How much we are attached to our own writings is shown plainly by our treatment of them. For although so great a period has already passed by, no one has ventured either to add to or to take from them, but it is inbred in all Jews from their very birth to regard them as the teachings of God, and to abide by them, and, if necessary, cheerfully to die for them. These remarks of the historian I have thought might advantageously be introduced in this connection. Another work of no little merit has been produced by the same writer, On the Supremacy of Reason, which some have called Maccabeicum, because it contains an account of the struggles of those Hebrews who contended manfully for the true religion, as is related in the books called Maccabees. And at the end of the twentieth book of his Antiquities, Josephus himself intimates that he had purposed to write a work in four books concerning God and his existence, according to the traditional opinions of the Jews, and also concerning the laws, why it is that they permit some things while prohibiting others. And the same writer also mentions in his own works other books written by himself. In addition to these things, it is proper to quote also the words that are found at the close of his antiquities, in confirmation of the testimony which we have drawn from his accounts. In that place he attacks Justice of Tiberius, who, like himself, had attempted to write a history of contemporary events, on the ground that he had not written truthfully. Having brought many other accusations against the man, he continues in these words, I indeed was not afraid in respect to my writings as you were, but, on the contrary, I presented my books to the emperors themselves when the events were almost under men's eyes. For I was conscious that I had preserved the truth in my account, and hence was not disappointed in my expectation of obtaining their attestation. And I presented my history also to many others, some of whom were present at the war, as, for instance, King Agrippa and some of his relatives. For the emperor Titus desired so much that the knowledge of the events should be communicated to men by my history alone, that he endorsed the books with his own hand, and commanded that they should be published. And King Agrippa wrote sixty-two epistles testifying to the truthfulness of my account. Of these epistles Josephus subjoins two. But this will suffice in regard to him. Let us now proceed with our history. Chapter 11 Simeon rules the church of Jerusalem after James. After the martyrdom of James and the conquest of Jerusalem which immediately followed, 
It is said that those of the apostles and disciples of the Lord that were still living came together from all directions with those that were related to the Lord according to the flesh, for the majority of them also were still alive, to take counsel as to who was worthy to succeed James. They all with one consent pronounced Simeon, the son of Clopas, of whom the gospel also makes mention, to be worthy of the episcopal throne of that parish. He was a cousin, as they say, of the Saviour. For Hegesippus records that Clopas was a brother of Joseph. Chapter 12. Vespasian commands the descendants of David to be sought. He also relates that Vespasian, after the conquest of Jerusalem, gave orders that all that belonged to the lineage of David should be sought out, in order that none of the royal race might be left among the Jews. And in consequence of this, a most terrible persecution again hung over the Jews. Chapter 13. Anencletus, the second bishop of Rome. After Vespasian had reigned ten years, Titus, his son, succeeded him. In the second year of his reign, Linus, who had been bishop of the Church of Rome for twelve years, delivered his office to Anencletus. But Titus was succeeded by his brother Domitian, after he had reigned two years and the same number of months. Chapter 14. Abilius, the second bishop of Alexandria. In the fourth year of Domitian, Anianus, the first bishop of the parish of Alexandria, died after holding office twenty-two years, and was succeeded by Abilius, the second bishop. Chapter 15. Clement, the third bishop of Rome. In the twelfth year of the same reign, Clement succeeded Anencletus, after the latter had been bishop of the Church of Rome for twelve years. The apostle in his epistle to the Philippians informs us that this Clement was his fellow worker. His words are as follows, With Clement and the rest of my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Chapter 16. The Epistle of Clement. There is extant an epistle of this Clement which is acknowledged to be genuine, and is of considerable length and of remarkable merit. He wrote it in the name of the Church of Rome to the Church of Corinth, when a sedition had arisen in the latter church. We know that this epistle also has been publicly used in a great many churches both in former times and in our own. And of the fact that a sedition did take place in the Church of Corinth at the time referred to, Hegesippus is a trustworthy witness. Chapter 17. The Persecution Under Domitian Domitian, having shown great cruelty toward many, and having unjustly put to death no small number of well-born and notable men at Rome, and having without cause exiled and confiscated the property of a great many other illustrious men, finally became a successor of Nero in his hatred and enmity toward God. He was, in fact, the second that stirred up a persecution against us, although his father Vespasian had undertaken nothing prejudicial to us. Chapter 18. The Apostle John and the Apocalypse It is said that in this persecution the Apostle and Evangelist John, who was still alive, was condemned to dwell on the island of Patmos in consequence of his testimony to the Divine Word. Irenaeus, in the fifth book of his work Against Heresies, where he discusses the number of the name of Antichrist which is given in the so-called Apocalypse of John, speaks as follows concerning him. If it were necessary for his name to be proclaimed openly at the present time, it would have been declared by him who saw the revelation. For it was seen not long ago, but almost in our own generation, at the end of the reign of Domitian. To such a degree, indeed, did the teaching of our faith flourish at that time, that even those writers who were far from our religion did not hesitate to mention in their histories the persecution and the martyrdoms which took place during it. And they, indeed, accurately indicated the time, for they recorded that in the fifteenth year of Domitian, Flavia Domitilla, daughter of a sister of Flavius Clement, who at that time was one of the consuls of Rome, was exiled with many others to the island of Pontia, in consequence of testimony borne to Christ. Chapter 19. Domitian commands the descendants of David to be slain. But when this same Domitian had commanded that the descendants of David should be slain, 
An ancient tradition says that some of the heretics brought accusation against the descendants of Jude, said to have been a brother of the Savior according to the flesh, on the ground that they were of the lineage of David and were related to Christ himself. Hegesippus relates these facts in the following words. Chapter 20 The Relatives of Our Savior Of the family of the Lord there were still living the grandchildren of Jude, who is said to have been the Lord's brother according to the flesh. Information was given that they belonged to the family of David, and they were brought to the emperor Domitian by the Evocatus, for Domitian feared the coming of Christ as Herod also had feared it. And he asked them if they were descendants of David, and they confessed that they were. Then he asked them how much property they had, or how much money they owned. And both of them answered that they had only nine thousand denarii, half of which belonged to each of them. And this property did not consist of silver, but of a piece of land which contained only thirty-nine acres, and from which they raised their taxes and supported themselves by their own labor. Then they showed their hands, exhibiting the hardness of their bodies and the callousness produced upon their hands by continuous toil, as evidence of their own labor. And when they were asked concerning Christ and his kingdom, of what sort it was, and where and when it was to appear, they answered that it was not a temporal nor an earthly kingdom, but a heavenly and angelic one, which would appear at the end of the world, when he should come in glory to judge the quick and the dead, and to give unto every one according to his works. Upon hearing this, Domitian did not pass judgment against them, but despising them as of no account, he let them go, and by a decree put a stop to the persecution of the church. But when they were released they ruled the churches because they were witnesses and were also relatives of the Lord. And peace being established, they lived until the time of Trajan. These things are related by Hegesippus. Tertullian also has mentioned Domitian in the following words. Domitian also, who possessed a share of Nero's cruelty, attempted once to do the same thing that the latter did. But because he had, I suppose, some intelligence, he very soon ceased, and even recalled those whom he had banished. But after Domitian had reigned fifteen years, and Nerva had succeeded to the empire, the Roman Senate, according to the writers that record the history of those days, voted that Domitian's honors should be cancelled, and that those who had been unjustly banished should return to their homes and have their property restored to them. It was at this time that the Apostle John returned from his banishment in the island and took up his abode at Ephesus, according to an ancient Christian tradition. Chapter 21 Serdon Becomes the Third Ruler of the Church of Alexandria after Nerva had reigned a little more than a year, he was succeeded by Trajan. It was during the first year of his reign that Abilius, who had ruled the church of Alexandria for thirteen years, was succeeded by Serdon. He was the third that presided over that church after Anianus, who was the first. At that time Clement still ruled the church of Rome, being also the third that held the episcopate there after Paul and Peter. Linus was the first, and after him came Anancletus. Book Three, Part Three of Eusebius Church History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson. Church History by Eusebius of Caesarea. Translated by Arthur Cushman McGifford. Book Three, Part Three, Chapters Twenty Two through Twenty Nine. Chapter Twenty Two Ignatius, the Second Bishop of Antioch. At this time, Ignatius was known as the Second Bishop of Antioch, Evodius having been the first. Simeon, likewise, was at that time the second ruler of the Church of Jerusalem, the brother of our Saviour, having been the first. Chapter Twenty Three Narrative Concerning John the Apostle At that time the Apostle and Evangelist John, the one whom Jesus loved, was still living in Asia, and governing the churches of that region, 
having returned after the death of Domitian from his exile on the island. And that he was still alive at that time may be established by the testimony of two witnesses. They should be trustworthy who have maintained the orthodoxy of the church, and such indeed were Irenaeus and Clement of Alexandria. The former, in the second book of his work Against Heresies, writes as follows, And all the elders that associated with John the disciple of the Lord in Asia bear witness that John delivered it to them, for he remained among them until the time of Trajan. And in the third book of the same work he attests the same thing in the following words, But the church in Ephesus also, which was founded by Paul, and where John remained until the time of Trajan, is a faithful witness of the apostolic tradition. Clement, likewise, in his book entitled What Rich Man Can Be Saved, indicates the time, and subjoins a narrative which is most attractive to those that enjoy hearing what is beautiful and profitable. Take and read the account which runs as follows. Listen to a tale, which is not a mere tale, but a narrative concerning John the Apostle, which has been handed down and treasured up in memory. For when, after the tyrant's death, he returned from the isle of Patmos to Ephesus, he went away upon their invitation to the neighboring territories of the Gentiles, to appoint bishops in some places, in other places to set in order whole churches, elsewhere to choose to the ministry some one of those that were pointed out by the Spirit. When he had come to one of the cities not far away, the name of which is given by some, and had consoled the brethren in other matters, he finally turned to the bishop that had been appointed, and seeing a youth of powerful physique, of pleasing appearance, and of ardent temperament, he said, This one I commit to thee in all earnestness in the presence of the church and with Christ as witness. And when the bishop had accepted the charge and had promised all, he repeated the same injunction with an appeal to the same witnesses, and then departed for Ephesus. But the presbyter, taking home the youth committed to him, reared, kept, cherished, and finally baptized him. After this he relaxed his stricter care and watchfulness, with the idea that in putting upon him the seal of the Lord he had given him a perfect protection. But some youths of his own age, idle and dissolute, and accustomed to evil practices, corrupted him when he was thus prematurely freed from restraint. At first they enticed him by costly entertainments. Then, when they went forth at night for robbery, they took him with them, and finally they demanded that he should unite with them in some greater crime. He gradually became accustomed to such practices, and on account of the positiveness of his character, leaving the right path, and taking the bit in his teeth like a hard-mouthed and powerful horse, he rushed the more violently down into the depths. And finally despairing of salvation in God, he no longer meditated what was insignificant, but having committed some great crime, since he was now lost once for all, he expected to suffer a like fate with the rest. Taking them, therefore, and forming a band of robbers, he became a bold bandit chief, the most violent, most bloody, most cruel of them all. Time passed, and some necessity having arisen, they sent for John. But he, when he had set in order the other matters on account of which he had come, said, Come, O bishop, restore us the deposit which both I and Christ committed to thee, the church over which thou presidest, being witness. But the bishop was at first confounded, thinking that he was falsely charged in regard to money which he had not received, and he could neither believe the accusation respecting what he had not, nor could he disbelieve John. But when he said, I demand the young man and the soul of the brother, the old man, groaning deeply and at the same time bursting into tears, said, He is dead. How, and what kind of death? He is dead to God, he said, for he turned wicked and abandoned, and at last a robber. And now, instead of the church, he haunts the mountain with a band like himself. But the apostle rent his clothes, and beating his head with great lamentation, he said, A fine guard I left for a brother's soul, but let a horse be brought me, and let some one show me the way. He rode away from the church just as he was, and coming to the place, he was taken prisoner by the robber's outpost. 
He, however, neither fled nor made entreaty, but cried out, For this did I come, lead me to your captain. The latter, meanwhile, was waiting, armed as he was. But when he recognized John approaching, he turned in shame to flee. But John, forgetting his age, pursued him with all his might, crying out, Why, my son, dost thou flee from me, thine own father, unarmed, aged? Pity me, my son, fear not. Thou hast still hope of life. I will give account to Christ for thee. If need be, I will willingly endure thy death as the Lord suffered death for us. For thee will I give up my life. Stand, believe, Christ hath sent me. And he, when he heard, first stopped and looked down. Then he threw away his arms, and then trembled and wept bitterly. And when the old man approached, he embraced him, making confession with lamentations as he was able, baptizing himself a second time with tears, and concealing only his right hand. But John, pledging himself and assuring him on oath that he would find forgiveness with the Savior, besought him, fell upon his knees, kissed his right hand itself as if now purified by repentance, and led him back to the church, and making intercession for him with copious prayers, and struggling together with him in continual fastings, and subduing his mind by various utterances, he did not depart, as they say, until he had restored him to the church, furnishing a great example of true repentance and a great proof of regeneration, a trophy of a visible resurrection. Chapter 24. The Order of the Gospels. This extract from Clement I have inserted here for the sake of the history and for the benefit of my readers. Let us now point out the undisputed writings of this apostle. And in the first place his gospel, which is known to all the churches under heaven, must be acknowledged as genuine, that it has with good reason been put by the ancients in the fourth place, after the other three gospels, may be made evident in the following way. Those great and truly divine men, I mean the apostles of Christ, were purified in their life, and were adorned with every virtue of the soul, but were uncultivated in speech. They were confident indeed in their trust in the divine and wonder-working power which was granted unto them by the Savior, but they did not know how, nor did they attempt to proclaim the doctrines of their teacher in studied and artistic language but employing only the demonstration of the divine spirit, which worked with them, and the wonder-working power of Christ, which was displayed through them, they published the knowledge of the kingdom of heaven throughout the whole world, paying little attention to the composition of written works. And this they did because they were assisted in their ministry by one greater than man. Paul, for instance, who surpassed them all in vigor of expression and in richness of thought, committed to writing no more than the briefest epistles, although he had innumerable mysterious matters to communicate, for he had attained even unto the sights of the third heaven, had been carried to the very paradise of God, and had been deemed worthy to hear unspeakable utterances there. And the rest of the followers of our Savior, the twelve apostles, the seventy disciples, and countless others besides, were not ignorant of these things, Nevertheless, of all the disciples of the Lord, only Matthew and John have left us written memorials, and they, tradition says, were led to write only under the pressure of necessity. For Matthew, who had at first preached to the Hebrews, when he was about to go to other peoples, committed his gospel to writing in his native tongue, and thus compensated those whom he was obliged to leave for the loss of his presence. And when Mark and Luke had already published their Gospels, they say that John, who had employed all his time in proclaiming the Gospel orally, finally proceeded to write for the following reason. The three Gospels already mentioned having come into the hands of all, and into his own, too, they say he accepted them and bore witness to their truthfulness, but that there was lacking in them an account of the deeds done by Christ at the beginning of his ministry. And this indeed is true. For it is evident that the three evangelists recorded only the deeds done by the Savior for one year after the imprisonment of John the Baptist, and indicated this in the beginning of their account. For Matthew, after the forty days' fast and the temptation which followed it, 
indicates the chronology of his work when he says, Now when he heard that John was delivered up, he withdrew from Judea into Galilee. Mark likewise says, Now after that John was delivered up, Jesus came into Galilee. And Luke, before commencing his account of the deeds of Jesus, similarly marks the time when he says that Herod, adding to all the evil deeds which he had done, shut up John in prison. They say, therefore, that the Apostle John, being asked to do it for this reason, gave in his gospel an account of the period which had been omitted by the earlier evangelists, and of the deeds done by the Savior during that period, that is, of those which were done before the imprisonment of the Baptist. And this is indicated by him, they say, in the following words, This beginning of miracles did Jesus. And again, when he refers to the Baptist in the midst of the deeds of Jesus, as still baptizing in Enon near Salim, when he states the matter clearly in the words, For John was not yet cast into prison. John accordingly, in his gospel, records the deeds of Christ which were performed before the Baptist was cast into prison, but the other three evangelists mention the events which happened after that time. One who understands this can no longer think that the Gospels are at variance with one another, inasmuch as the Gospel according to John contains the first acts of Christ, while the others give an account of the latter part of his life. And the genealogy of our Savior according to the flesh John quite naturally omitted, because it had been already given by Matthew and Luke, and began with the doctrine of his divinity, which had, as it were, been reserved for him, as their superior by the divine spirit. These things may suffice, which we have said concerning the Gospel of John. The cause which led to the composition of the Gospel of Mark has been already stated by us. But as for Luke, in the beginning of his Gospel, he states himself the reasons which led him to write it. He states that since many others had more rashly undertaken to compose a narrative of the events of which he had acquired perfect knowledge, he himself, feeling the necessity of freeing us from their uncertain questions, delivered in his own gospel an accurate account of those events in regard to which he had learned the full truth, being aided by his intimacy and his stay with Paul, and by his acquaintance with the rest of the apostles. So much for our own account of these things. But in a more fitting place we shall attempt to show by quotations from the ancients what others have said concerning them. But of the writings of John, not only his gospel, but also the former of his epistles, has been accepted without dispute both now and in ancient times, but the other two are disputed. In regard to the apocalypse, the opinions of most men are still divided. But at the proper time this question likewise shall be decided from the testimony of the ancients. Chapter 25. The Divine Scriptures that are accepted and those that are not. Since we are dealing with this subject, it is proper to sum up the writings of the New Testament which have been already mentioned. First then must be put the Holy Quaternion of the Gospels, following them with the Acts of the Apostles. After this must be reckoned the epistles of Paul, next in order the extant former epistle of John, and likewise the epistle of Peter, must be maintained. After them is to be placed, if it really seem proper, the apocalypse of John, concerning which we shall give the different opinions at the proper time. These then belong among the accepted writings. Among the disputed writings, which are nevertheless recognized by many, are extant the so-called Epistle of James and that of Jude, also the second Epistle of Peter, and those that are called the second and third of John, whether they belong to the evangelist or to another person of the same name. Among the rejected writings must be reckoned also the Acts of Paul and the so-called Shepherd and the Apocalypse of Peter, and in addition to these the extant Epistle of Barnabas and the so-called Teachings of the Apostles, and besides, as I said, the Apocalypse of John, if it seem proper, which some, as I said, reject, but which others class with the accepted books. And among these some have placed also the Gospel according to the Hebrews, with which those of the Hebrews that have accepted Christ are especially delighted. 
and all these may be reckoned among the disputed books. But we have nevertheless felt compelled to give a catalogue of these also, distinguishing those works which according to ecclesiastical tradition are true and genuine and commonly accepted, from those others which, although not canonical but disputed, are yet at the same time known to most ecclesiastical writers. We have felt compelled to give this catalogue in order that we might be able to know both these works and those that are cited by the heretics under the name of the apostles, including, for instance, such books as the Gospels of Peter, of Thomas, of Matthias, or of any others besides them, and the Acts of Andrew and John, and the other apostles, which no one belonging to the succession of ecclesiastical writers has deemed worthy of mention in his writings. And further, the character of the style is at variance with apostolic usage, and both the thoughts and the purpose of the things that are related in them are so completely out of accord with true orthodoxy that they clearly show themselves to be the fictions of heretics. Wherefore they are not to be placed even among the rejected writings, but are all of them to be cast aside as absurd and impious. Let us now proceed with our history. Chapter 26. Menander the Sorcerer Menander, who succeeded Simon Magus, showed himself in his conduct another instrument of diabolical power, not inferior to the former. He also was a Samaritan, and carried his sorceries to no less an extent than his teacher had done, and at the same time reveled in still more marvelous tales than he. For he said that he was himself the Savior, who had been sent down from invisible eons for the salvation of men, and he taught that no one could gain the mastery over the world creating angels themselves, unless he had first gone through the magical discipline imparted by him, and had received baptism from him. Those who were deemed worthy of this would partake even in the present life of perpetual immortality, and would never die, but would remain here forever, and without growing old become immortal. These facts can be easily learned from the works of Irenaeus. And Justin, in the passage in which he mentions Simon, gives an account of this man also, in the following words, And we know that a certain Menander, who was also a Samaritan from the village of Caparatea, was a disciple of Simon, and that he also, being driven by the demons, came to Antioch and deceived many by his magical art. And he persuaded his followers that they should not die, and there are still some of them that assert this. And it was indeed an artifice of the devil to endeavor, by means of such sorcerers, who assumed the name of Christians, to defame the great mystery of godliness by magic art, and through them to make ridiculous the doctrines of the church concerning the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the dead. But they that have chosen these men as their saviors have fallen away from the true hope. Chapter 27. The Heresy of the Ebionites the evil demon, however, being unable to tear certain others from their allegiance to the Christ of God, yet found them susceptible in a different direction, and so brought them over to his own purposes. The ancients quite properly called these men Ebionites, because they held poor and mean opinions concerning Christ. For they considered him a plain and common man, who was justified only because of his superior virtue, and who was the fruit of the intercourse of a man with Mary. In their opinion the observance of the ceremonial law was altogether necessary, on the ground that they could not be saved by faith in Christ alone and by a corresponding life. There were others, however, besides them, that were of the same name, but avoided the strange and absurd beliefs of the former, and did not deny that the Lord was born of a virgin and of the Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, inasmuch as they also refused to acknowledge that he pre-existed, being God, word, and wisdom, they turned aside into the impiety of the former, especially when they, like them, endeavored to observe strictly the bodily worship of the law. These men, moreover, thought that it was necessary to reject all the epistles of the apostle, whom they called an apostate from the law, and they used only the so-called gospel according to the Hebrews, and made small account of the rest. The Sabbath and the rest of the discipline of the Jews they observed just like them, but at the same time, like us, 
they celebrated the Lord's days as a memorial of the resurrection of the Savior. Wherefore, in consequence of such a course, they received the name of Ebionites, which signified the poverty of their understanding. For this is the name by which a poor man is called among the Hebrews. Chapter 28. Serinthus the Heresiarch. We have understood that at this time Serinthus, the author of another heresy, made his appearance. Caius, whose words we quoted above, in the disputation which is ascribed to him, writes as follows concerning this man. But Serinthus also, by means of revelations which he pretends were written by a great apostle, brings before us marvelous things which he falsely claims were shown him by angels, and he says that after the resurrection the kingdom of Christ will be set up on earth, and that the flesh dwelling in Jerusalem will again be subject to desires and pleasures. And being an enemy of the scriptures of God, he asserts, with the purpose of deceiving men, that there is to be a period of a thousand years for marriage festivals. And Dionysius, who was bishop of the parish of Alexandria in our day, in the second book of his work on the promises, where he says some things concerning the apocalypse of John which he draws from tradition, mentions this same man in the following words. But, they say that Serinthus, who founded the sect which was called after him the Serinthian, desiring reputable authority for his fiction, prefixed the name. For the doctrine which he taught was this, that the kingdom of Christ will be an earthly one. And as he was himself devoted to the pleasures of the body and altogether sensual in his nature, he dreamed that the kingdom would consist in those things which he desired, namely in the delights of the belly and of sexual passion, that is to say in eating and drinking and marrying, and in festivals and sacrifices and the slaying of victims, under the guise of which he thought he could indulge his appetites with a better grace. These are the words of Dionysius, but Irenaeus, in the first book of his work against heresies, gives some more abominable false doctrines of the same man, and in the third book relates a story which deserves to be recorded. He says, on the authority of Polycarp, that the apostle John once entered a bath to bathe, but learning that Serinthus was within, he sprang from the place and rushed out of the door, for he could not bear to remain under the same roof with him. And he advised those that were with him to do the same, saying, Let us flee, lest the bath fall, for Serinthus, the enemy of the truth, is within. Chapter 29. Nicolaus and the Sect Named After Him at this time the so-called sect of the Nicolaitans made its appearance and lasted for a very short time. Mention is made of it in the Apocalypse of John. They boasted that the author of their sect was Nicolaus, one of the deacons who, with Stephen, were appointed by the apostles for the purpose of ministering to the poor. Clement of Alexandria, in the third book of his Stromata, relates the following things concerning him. They say that he had a beautiful wife, and after the ascension of the Saviour, being accused by the apostles of jealousy, he led her into their midst and gave permission to any one that wished to marry her. For they say that this was in accord with that saying of his, that one ought to abuse the flesh. And those that have followed his heresy, imitating blindly and foolishly that which was done and said, commit fornication without shame. But I understand that Nicolaus had to do with no other woman than her to whom he was married, and that, so far as his children are concerned, his daughters continued in a state of virginity until old age, and his son remained uncorrupt. If this is so, when he brought his wife, whom he jealously loved, into the midst of the apostles, he was evidently renouncing his passion, and when he used the expression to abuse the flesh, he was inculcating self-control in the face of those pleasures that are eagerly pursued. For I suppose that, in accordance with the command of the Saviour, he did not wish to serve two masters, pleasure and the Lord. But they say that Matthias also taught in the same manner that we ought to fight against and abuse the flesh, and not give way to it for the sake of pleasure, but strengthen the soul by faith and knowledge. So much concerning those who then attempted to pervert the truth, but in less time than it has taken to tell, it became entirely extinct. Book 3, Part 4 of Eusebius Church History This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Leeson Church History by Eusebius of Caesarea Translated by Arthur Cushman McGifford Book 3, Part 4, Chapters 30 through 39 Chapter 30 The Apostles That Were Married Clement, indeed, whose words we have just quoted, after the above-mentioned facts, gives a statement, on account of those who rejected marriage, of the apostles that had wives. Or will they, says he, reject even the apostles? For Peter and Philip begat children, and Philip also gave his daughters in marriage. And Paul does not hesitate, in one of his epistles, to greet his wife, whom he did not take about with him, that he might not be inconvenienced in his ministry. And since we have mentioned this subject, it is not improper to subjoin another account which is given by the same author and which is worth reading. In the seventh book of his Stromata he writes as follows. They say accordingly that when the blessed Peter saw his own wife led out to die, he rejoiced because of her summons and her return home, and called to her very encouragingly and comfortingly, addressing her by name, and saying, O thou, remember the Lord! Such was the marriage of the blessed, and their perfect disposition toward those dearest to them. This account being in keeping with the subject in hand, I have related here in its proper place. Chapter 31. The Death of John and Philip. The time and the manner of the death of Paul and Peter, as well as their burial places, have been already shown by us. The time of John's death has also been given in a general way, but his burial place is indicated by an epistle of Polycrates, who was bishop of the parish of Ephesus, addressed to Victor, bishop of Rome. In this epistle he mentions him together with the apostle Philip and his daughters in the following words. For in Asia also great lights have fallen asleep, which shall rise again on the last day, at the coming of the Lord, when he shall come with glory from heaven and shall seek out all the saints. Among these are Philip, one of the twelve apostles, who sleeps in Hierapolis, and his two aged virgin daughters, and another daughter who lived in the Holy Spirit and now rests at Ephesus. And moreover John, who was both a witness and a teacher, who reclined upon the bosom of the Lord, and being a priest wore the sacerdotal plate. He also sleeps at Ephesus. So much concerning their death, and in the dialogue of Caius, which we mentioned a little above, Proclus, against whom he directed his disputation, in agreement with what had been quoted, speaks thus concerning the death of Philip and his daughters. After him there were four prophetesses, the daughters of Philip, at Hierapolis in Asia. Their tomb is there, and the tomb of their father. Such is his statement. But Luke, in the Acts of the Apostles, mentions the daughters of Philip who were at that time in Caesarea in Judea with their father, and were honored with the gift of prophecy. His words are as follows, We came unto Caesarea, and entering into the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, we abode with him. Now this man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. We have thus set forth in these pages what has come to our knowledge concerning the apostles themselves and the apostolic age, and concerning the sacred writings which they have left us, as well as concerning those which are disputed, but nevertheless have been publicly used by many in a great number of churches, and moreover concerning those that are altogether rejected and are out of harmony with apostolic orthodoxy. Having done this, let us now proceed with our history. Chapter 32. Simeon, Bishop of Jerusalem, Suffers Martyrdom. It is reported that after the age of Nero and Domitian, under the emperor whose times we are now recording, a persecution was stirred up against us in certain cities in consequence of a popular uprising. In this persecution we have understood that Simeon, the son of Clopas, who, as we have shown, was the second bishop of the Church of Jerusalem, suffered martyrdom. Hegesippus, whose words we have already quoted in various places, is a witness to this fact also. Speaking of certain heretics, he adds that Simeon was accused by them at this time, and since it was clear that he was a Christian, 
he was tortured in various ways for many days, and astonished even the judge himself and his attendants in the highest degree, and finally he suffered a death similar to that of our Lord. But there is nothing like hearing the historian himself, who writes as follows. Certain of these heretics brought accusation against Simeon, the son of Clopas, on the ground that he was a descendant of David and a Christian, and thus he suffered martyrdom at the age of one hundred and twenty years, while Trajan was emperor and Atticus governor. And the same writer says that his accusers also, when search was made for the descendants of David, were arrested as belonging to that family and it might be reasonably assumed that Simeon was one of those that saw and heard the Lord, judging from the length of his life, and from the fact that the Gospel makes mention of Mary, the wife of Clopas, who was the father of Simeon, as has been already shown. The same historian says that there were also others, descended from one of the so-called brothers of the Savior, whose name was Judas, who, after they had borne testimony before Domitian, as has been already recorded, in behalf of faith in Christ, lived until the same reign. He writes as follows, They came, therefore, and took the lead of every church as witnesses and as relatives of the Lord. And profound peace being established in every church, they remained until the reign of the emperor Trajan, and until the above-mentioned Simeon, son of Clopas, an uncle of the Lord, was informed against by the heretics, and was himself in like manner accused for the same cause before the governor Atticus. And after being tortured for many days he suffered martyrdom, and all, including even the proconsul, marveled that at the age of one hundred and twenty years he could endure so much, and orders were given that he should be crucified. In addition to these things the same man, while recounting the events of that period, records that the church up to that time had remained a pure and uncorrupted virgin, since, if there were any that attempted to corrupt the sound norm of the preaching of salvation, they lay until then concealed in obscure darkness. But when the sacred college of apostles had suffered death in various forms, and the generation of those that had been deemed worthy to hear the inspired wisdom with their own ears had passed away, then the league of godless error took its rise as a result of the folly of heretical teachers, who, because none of the apostles was still living, attempted henceforth, with a bold face, to proclaim in opposition to the preaching of the truth the knowledge which is falsely so called. Chapter 33. Trajan Forbids the Christians to be Sought After so great a persecution was at that time opened against us in many places that Plinius Secundus, one of the most noted of governors, being disturbed by the great number of martyrs, communicated with the emperor concerning the multitude of those that were put to death for their faith. At the same time, he informed him in his communication that he had not heard of their doing anything profane or contrary to the laws, except that they arose at dawn and sang hymns to Christ as a god, but that they renounced adultery and murder and like criminal offenses, and did all things in accordance with the laws. In reply to this, Trajan made the following decree, that the race of Christians should not be sought after, but when found should be punished. On account of this the persecution which had threatened to be a most terrible one was to a certain degree checked, but there were still left plenty of pretexts for those who wished to do us harm. Sometimes the people, sometimes the rulers in various places, would lay plots against us, so that, although no great persecutions took place, local persecutions were nevertheless going on in particular provinces, and many of the faithful endured martyrdom in various forms. We have taken our account from the Latin Apology of Tertullian which we mentioned above. The translation runs as follows, And indeed we have found that search for us has been forbidden. For when Plinius Secundus, the governor of a province, had condemned certain Christians and deprived them of their dignity, he was confounded by the multitude, and was uncertain what further course to pursue. He therefore communicated with Trajan the emperor, informing him that, aside from their unwillingness to sacrifice, he had found no impiety in them. And he reported this also, that the Christians arose early in the morning and sang hymns unto Christ as a god, and for the purpose of preserving their discipline forbade murder, adultery, 
avarice, robbery, and the like. In reply to this, Trajan wrote that the race of Christians should not be sought after, but when found should be punished. Such were the events which took place at that time. Chapter 34. Everestus, the fourth bishop of the Church of Rome. In the third year of the reign of the emperor mentioned above, Clement committed the episcopal government of the Church of Rome to Everestus, and departed this life after he had superintended the teaching of the divine word nine years in all. Chapter 35. Justus, the third bishop of Jerusalem. But when Simeon also had died in the manner described, a certain Jew by the name of Justus succeeded to the episcopal throne in Jerusalem. He was one of the many thousands of the circumcision who at that time believed in Christ. Chapter 36. Ignatius and his Epistles. At that time Polycarp, a disciple of the Apostles, was a man of eminence in Asia, having been entrusted with the episcopate of the church of Smyrna by those who had seen and heard the Lord. And at the same time Papias, bishop of the parish of Hierapolis, became well known, as did also Ignatius, who was chosen bishop of Antioch, second in succession to Peter, and whose fame is still celebrated by a great many. Report says that he was sent from Syria to Rome, and became food for wild beasts on account of his testimony to Christ. And as he made the journey through Asia under the strictest military surveillance, he fortified the parishes in the various cities where he stopped by oral homilies and exhortations, and warned them above all to be especially on their guard against the heresies that were then beginning to prevail, and exhorted them to hold fast to the tradition of the apostles. Moreover, he thought it necessary to attest that tradition in writing, and to give it a fixed form for the sake of greater security. So when he came to Smyrna, where Polycarp was, he wrote an epistle to the church of Ephesus, in which he mentions Onesimus, its pastor, and another to the church of Magnesia, situated upon the Meander, in which he makes mention again of a bishop Damas, and finally one to the church of Tralles, whose bishop, he states, was at that time Polybius. In addition to these, he wrote also to the Church of Rome, entreating them not to secure his release from martyrdom, and thus rob him of his earnest hope. In confirmation of what has been said, it is proper to quote briefly from this epistle. He writes as follows, From Syria even unto Rome I fight with wild beasts, by land and by sea, by night and by day, being bound amidst ten leopards, that is, a company of soldiers who only become worse when they are well treated. In the midst of their wrongdoings, however, I am more fully learning discipleship, but I am not thereby justified. May I have joy of the beasts that are prepared for me, and I pray that I may find them ready. I will even coax them to devour me quickly, that they may not treat me as they have some whom they have refused to touch through fear. And if they are unwilling, I will compel them. Forgive me. I know what is expedient for me. Now do I begin to be a disciple. May naught of things visible and things invisible envy me, that I may attain unto Jesus Christ. Let fire and cross and attacks of wild beasts, let wrenching of bones, cutting of limbs, crushing of the whole body, tortures of the devil, let all these come upon me, if only I may attain unto Jesus Christ. These things he wrote from the above-mentioned city to the churches referred to. And when he had left Smyrna, he wrote again from Troas to the Philadelphians and to the church of Smyrna, and particularly to Polycarp, who presided over the latter church. And since he knew him well as an apostolic man, he commended to him, like a true and good shepherd, the flock at Antioch, and besought him to care diligently for it. And the same man, writing to the Smyrnians, used the following words concerning Christ, taken I know not whence. But I know and believe that he was in the flesh after the resurrection, and when he came to Peter and his companions, he said to them, Take, handle me, and see that I am not an incorporeal spirit. And immediately they touched him and believed. Irenaeus also knew of his martyrdom and mentions his epistles in the following words. As one of our people said, when he was condemned to the beasts on account of his testimony unto God, 
I am God's wheat, and by the teeth of wild beasts am I ground, that I may be found pure bread. Polycarp also mentions these letters in the epistle to the Philippians, which is ascribed to him. His words are as follows. I exhort all of you, therefore, to be obedient and to practice all patience such as ye saw with your own eyes, not only in the blessed Ignatius and Rufus and Zosimus, but also in others from among yourselves, as well as in Paul himself and the rest of the apostles, being persuaded that all these ran not in vain, but in faith and righteousness, and that they are gone to their rightful place beside the Lord, with whom also they suffered. For they loved not the present world, but him that died for our sakes and was raised by God for us. And afterwards he adds, You have written to me, both you and Ignatius, that if any one go to Syria, he may carry with him the letters from you. And this I will do if I have a suitable opportunity, either I myself or one whom I send to be an ambassador for you also. The epistles of Ignatius which were sent to us by him and the others which we had with us we sent to you as you gave charge. They are appended to this epistle, and from them you will be able to derive great advantage, for they comprise faith and patience, and every kind of edification that pertaineth to our Lord. So much concerning Ignatius, but he was succeeded by Heros in the episcopate of the church of Antioch. Chapter 37. The Evangelists That Were Still Eminent At That Time Among those that were celebrated at that time was Quadratus, who, report says, was renowned along with the daughters of Philip for his prophetical gifts. And there were many others besides these who were known in those days, and who occupied the first place among the successors of the apostles. And they also, being illustrious disciples of such great men, built up the foundations of the churches which had been laid by the apostles in every place, and preached the gospel more and more widely, and scattered the saving seeds of the kingdom of heaven far and near throughout the whole world. For indeed most of the disciples of that time, animated by the divine word and with a more ardent love for philosophy, had already fulfilled the command of the Savior, and had distributed their goods to the needy, then starting out upon long journeys they performed the office of evangelists, being filled with the desire to preach Christ to those who had not yet heard the word of faith, and to deliver to them the divine gospels. And when they had only laid the foundations of the faith in foreign places, they appointed others as pastors, and entrusted them with the nurture of those that had recently been brought in, while they themselves went on again to other countries and nations, with the grace and the cooperation of God. For a great many wonderful works were done through them by the power of the Divine Spirit, so that at the first hearing whole multitudes of men eagerly embraced the religion of the Creator of the universe. But since it is impossible for us to enumerate the names of all that became shepherds or evangelists in the churches throughout the world in the age immediately succeeding the apostles, we have recorded, as was fitting, the names of those only who have transmitted the apostolic doctrine to us in writings still extant. Chapter 38. The Epistle of Clement and the Writings Falsely Ascribed to Him Thus Ignatius has done in the epistles which we have mentioned, and Clement in his epistle which is accepted by all, and which he wrote in the name of the Church of Rome to the Church of Corinth. In this epistle he gives many thoughts drawn from the epistle to the Hebrews, and also quotes verbally some of its expressions, thus showing most plainly that it is not a recent production. Wherefore it has seemed reasonable to reckon it with the other writings of the Apostle. For as Paul had written to the Hebrews in his native tongue, some say that the evangelist Luke, others that this Clement himself, translated the Epistle. The latter seems more probable, because the epistle of Clement and that to the Hebrews have a similar character in regard to style, and still further because the thoughts contained in the two works are not very different. But it must be observed also that there is said to be a second epistle of Clement, but we do not know that it is recognized like the former, for we do not find that the ancients have made any use of it and certain men have lately brought forward other wordy and lengthy writings under his name, containing dialogues of Peter and Appion, 
but no mention has been made of these by the ancients, for they do not even preserve the pure stamp of apostolic orthodoxy. The acknowledged writing of Clement is well known. We have spoken also of the works of Ignatius and Polycarp. Chapter 39. The Writings of Papias. There are extant five books of Papias, which bear the title Expositions of Oracles of the Lord. Irenaeus makes mention of these as the only works written by him in the following words. These things are attested by Papias, an ancient man who was a hearer of John and a companion of Polycarp, in his fourth book. For five books have been written by him. These are the words of Irenaeus. But Papias himself, in the preface to his discourses, by no means declares that he was himself a hearer and eyewitness of the holy apostles, but he shows by the words which he uses that he received the doctrines of the faith from those who were their friends. He says, But I shall not hesitate also to put down for you along with my interpretations whatsoever things I have at any time learned carefully from the elders and carefully remembered, guaranteeing their truth. For I did not, like the multitude, take pleasure in those that speak much, but in those that teach the truth, not in those that relate strange commandments, but in those that deliver the commandments given by the Lord to faith, and springing from the truth itself. If, then, any one came who had been a follower of the elders, I questioned him in regard to the words of the elders, what Andrew or what Peter said, or what was said by Philip or by Thomas or by James or by John or by Matthew, or by any other of the disciples of the Lord, and what things Aristion and the presbyter John, the disciples of the Lord, say. For I did not think that what was to be gotten from the books would profit me as much as what came from the living and abiding voice. It is worthwhile observing here that the name John is twice enumerated by him. The first one he mentions in connection with Peter and James and Matthew and the rest of the apostles, clearly meaning the evangelist. But the other John he mentions after an interval, and places him among others outside of the number of the apostles, putting Aristion before him, and he distinctly calls him a presbyter. This shows that the statement of those is true, who say that there were two persons in Asia that bore the same name, and that there were two tombs in Ephesus, each of which, even to the present day, is called John's. It is important to notice this, for it is probable that it was the second, if one is not willing to admit that it was the first that saw the revelation, which is ascribed by name to John. And Papias, of whom we are now speaking, confesses that he received the words of the apostles from those that followed them, but says that he was himself a hearer of Aristion and the presbyter John. At least he mentions them frequently by name, and gives their traditions in his writings. These things, we hope, have not been uselessly adduced by us. But it is fitting to subjoin to the words of Papias which have been quoted other passages from his works in which he relates some other wonderful events which he claims to have received from tradition. That Philip the Apostle dwelt at Hierapolis with his daughters has been already stated. But it must be noted here that Papias, their contemporary, says that he heard a wonderful tale from the daughters of Philip, for he relates that in his time one rose from the dead, and he tells another wonderful story of Justice, surnamed Barsabbas, that he drank a deadly poison, and yet by the grace of the Lord suffered no harm. The book of Acts records that the holy apostles, after the ascension of the Savior, put forward this Justice, together with Matthias, and prayed that one might be chosen in place of the traitor Judas, to fill up their number. The account is as follows, and they put forward two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justus, and Matthias, and they prayed and said. The same writer gives also other accounts which he says came to him through unwritten tradition, certain strange parables and teachings of the Savior, and some other more mythical things. To these belong his statement that there will be a period of some thousand years after the resurrection of the dead, and that the kingdom of Christ will be set up in material form on this very earth. I suppose he got these ideas through a misunderstanding of the apostolic accounts, not perceiving that the things said by them were spoken mystically in figures. 
for he appears to have been of very limited understanding, as one can see from his discourses. But it was due to him that so many of the church fathers after him adopted a like opinion, urging in their own support the antiquity of the man, as for instance Irenaeus and any one else that may have proclaimed similar views. Papias gives also in his own work other accounts of the words of the Lord on the authority of Aristion who was mentioned above, and traditions as handed down by the presbyter John, to whom we refer those who are fond of learning. But now we must add to the words of his which we have already quoted the tradition which he gives in regard to Mark, the author of the Gospel. This also the presbyter said, Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately, though not in order, whatsoever he remembered of the things said or done by Christ. For he neither heard the Lord nor followed him, but afterward, as I said, he followed Peter, who adapted his teaching to the needs of his hearers, but with no intention of giving a connected account of the Lord's discourses, so that Mark committed no error while he thus wrote some things as he remembered them. For he was careful of one thing, not to omit any of the things which he had heard, and not to state any of them falsely. These things are related by Papias concerning Mark. But concerning Matthew he writes as follows, So then Matthew wrote the oracles in the Hebrew language, and every one interpreted them as he was able. And the same writer uses testimonies from the first epistle of John, and from that of Peter likewise. And he relates another story of a woman, who was accused of many sins before the Lord, which is contained in the gospel according to the Hebrews. These things we have thought it necessary to observe in addition to what has been already stated. <music>